Hello, my name is Dr. Hood and I'm going to be your instructor for this astronomy class for this eight week session. I wanted to create a short video to introduce myself and to briefly talk about what we'll be doing um, during this term. So I created a few slides that I'd like to uh, share with you very quickly and talk a little bit about myself. So as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Hood, um, Dr. Carol Hood. So my husband, um, Mike Hood, is the uh, co-chair of the Earth Science and Astronomy Department. So some of you may have had his classes before. Some of you may have seen him around um, Mount SAC or the department before. Uh, if you have any questions about me um, or any problems with the class, you can go to him. Or if you're uncomfortable going to him because he is my spouse, the other co-chair is Julie Brayali. Um, so if there are any concerns um, about me or this course that you don't feel comfortable bringing to me or to him, um, I'll direct you to her so that that way you know that you're getting an impartial person to talk to. So uh, in this course, there are a few things that we'll talk about. So I'm going to do a very brief overview of some astronomical topics. Um, I'm going to have a survey that for you all to fill out that'll ask for things that you're interested in. Um, so some may be these, some may be something else. Um, but since this is a course that covers a lot of stuff, we won't be able to go through everything. And in fact, I'll pare it down from what I normally do, um, given the circumstances we're living in right now. But just a, a quick uh, overview to sort of whet your appetite, so to speak. Um, so one important thing that we do in all the classes is moon phases. What are they? Um, why do they occur? How do we know that they occur? Telescopes. So there's a picture of an astronaut who is replacing the solar panels on the Hubble Space Telescope, if I remember correctly. The blue in the background here uh, is Earth, and the black is, is space out there. The blue actually comes from Earth's atmosphere, and we'll talk about some of that stuff as well. The astronaut's on the end of one of the robotic arms that was attached to the space shuttle back when it was still um, working. This picture was taken back in the 90s, if I remember correctly or as my kids call it, the 1900s, to make me feel old. Um, here are some of the very first pictures we had uh, that proved that extrasolar planets existed. So we had indirect evidence of extrasolar planets before, uh, meaning planets that are orbiting stars other than our sun. Um, but it took a while for us, for our technology to improve enough where we could actually take images. So the um, little dots there in the corner in the blown up picture that say 2004 and 2006. So that is the Fomhalt B planet orbiting the Fomhalt B star, which is mostly blocked out here because it's so, so bright. Um, so it's roughly where that big white dot in the middle of the big picture is, but uh, the black around it is um, what they're using to block out the star's light inside the telescope. So you can see that's how far that particular planet moved in the two years between 2004 and 2006. Um, this is a picture of an, an asterism. It's the, uh, the Big Dipper. So if you follow those bright stars there, it looks like an upside down ladle um, or an upside down pot. That's known as the Big Dipper. Um, constellations and asterisms of the brightest stars have been used for navigation for thousands of years. Um, we won't focus too much of that on this class. Um, we'll focus more on the science, but they, there's a reason why they're involved in so much of the mythology and stories and beliefs um, of numerous civilizations throughout time all over the world. We'll talk about galaxies. So this is a spiral galaxy that's similar to our own Milky Way, which is the name of the galaxy that we live in. Um, it's called a barred galaxy. If you look through the middle there, there's a little bit of a bar um, before you get to the spiral arms. I just think this is a beautiful picture, so I like to show it off. Um, and then lastly, this is an image that's actually made from a simulation, a computer simulation of dark matter particles. So um, given time and interest, we'll talk about dark matter, what we think it is, how we know it exists, and how we know how much of it is there. Um, so it's kind of like uh, knowing there's something in a box and you can go through and shake it and weigh it and try and learn about it without actually opening the box to figure out exactly what it is. That's sort of where we are with dark matter. Um, and then cosmology is, is the study of the universe as a whole. So there'll be different bits and pieces 
related to cosmology that we'll talk about. So if there's anything that specifically interests you, um, put that in the survey and we'll see if we can't um, find a way to get to that particular topic this term also. So um, I wanted to uh, briefly talk about myself. I usually give this, of course, in person for an in-person class. A little history of me and my life. So I have a number of pictures here. Um, starting from the upper left, that is one of the space shuttles being flown over the Johnson Space Center um, in Houston. So that's where all the astronauts uh, work and live until they actually are shot up into space. So I grew up um, just outside of there. And if you look at the, uh, the bayou there, in the upper right corner of that image. There's a couple neighborhoods on the other side. That's essentially where I grew up, um, very close to JSC, the Johnson Space Center. Um, and I lived there until it was time for me to start middle school. My parents then told us that we were gonna move right after telling us we were gonna go on a trip to Hawaii, which was like the first vacation I think my family ever took on, the, on a grand scale, other than going to like my grandparents' house. Um, in Central Texas. So they, I always called that the pity trip because they threw out this carrot and then slammed the bomb right behind it telling us we we're moving. So I moved um, uh, right uh, at the beginning of high school and I moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. So that's the lower left-hand picture. That's a picture of the rotunda. So Thomas Jefferson, our third president, um, lived just outside of Charlottesville and he created the University of Virginia and designed that rotunda itself. Um, so not only is he a founding father of the country, uh, helped write the Declaration of Independence, um, he is also a founding father of the university at which my parents worked um, for a while, from when I was in high school until they retired. And there's a tiny little statue of Thomas Jefferson, or TJ, if you um, live in Charlottesville, you're on a nickname basis with him. Um, so I went to high school in uh, Charlottesville, it's where the University of Virginia is, hence the, uh, the university my parents worked at. I'm a second generation uh, college student and also now college professor, um, which is kind of nice. So um, my parents were able to provide a, a very lovely and privileged childhood, um, which I hope that uh, college will allow you to provide for you and your families as well. So anyway, uh, my parents worked at the University of Virginia, um, which was in the same town I went to high school with. So when it came time for me to go to college, I did not want to go there um, because I did not want to be in the same place as my parents. So I went to the other large university in the state of Virginia. I went to Virginia Tech. Um, so I'm a big Hokies fan. We'll see if college football happens this fall or not. Um, but if it does, I am all about the Hokies. Um, so I went to Virginia Tech for my undergraduate. I majored in physics. I was one of very few women there. Physics is not a field that is populated by a lot of women, um, but that's something that we're trying to change now. Um, then I went to graduate school at UC Irvine, so that's what brought me to California. So I lived in Orange County um, as I went to graduate school for the next six and a half or so years. And that's where I met my husband, uh, I mentioned, Mike Hood. Um, so he's in the picture in the upper right with two of our dogs. Um, Molly is the beagle-ish looking one, the short hair, uh, mostly white with black spotting and, and a brown head. And then Nikki's the furrier one, um, smaller, closer to Mike there. So. Nikki, we had to put her down last August, almost a year ago. She was almost 18. Uh, or Molly, I think I now messed up names. And then Nikki is still with us, but she's about to turn 17. Um, so I have had those dogs since I was in college. You can try and do the math to figure out how old I am if you're really curious. Um, but they were my first babies. And then along the way, um, Mike and I had two kids of our own. Um, so that is Elliot and Andrew in the bottom picture there. This picture's a couple of years old now. So Andrew is in kindergarten. Um, he's the one sporting the very beautiful haircut that he gave himself that year um, with the very short bangs. Uh, and Elliot is in the background there behind Mike. He's in third grade now. Um, it is quite likely you will see them at some point during this term because they love jumping in me, um, my videos behind when I'm in meetings and whatnot. So uh, I would 
I would gather you'll see them at some point and apologies if you don't want to because there's not a whole lot we can do while we're homeschooling and trying to do our first jobs at the same time as I know many of you are also struggling with the same the same new realities that we're currently living in so that's a bit about me um, I knew in high school that I wanted to go into physics and I knew that I liked astronomy a lot um, but there are very few astronomy only departments but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. It's just something that interested me. So I went to undergrad for my physics degree. And by the time I went to UC Irvine, I knew I wanted to do astronomy. Um, and then while at UC Irvine, I did a lot of outreach to um, K-12 schools, like elementary, middle, high school schools. And I realized that I love teaching. Um, and I loved seeing um, students get excited about science. Um, in my experience, there's some teachers that are really great about it, and there's other teachers that could care less. Um, and I, I'm very disappointed in that. So that's something that I want to try and encourage because I think science should be open to all, and I think it's fun, and I think it's exciting, and I think that memorizing a whole bunch of stuff is not science. So that is not what we're going to be doing in this class. So if that's what you're looking for, I'm sorry. Um, that is why I hated biology because it was just memorize a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and I was not a fan when I took school. I think there are some instructors who are changing that, but that's what it was, unfortunately, for me. Um, whereas astronomy was, uh, was much more open and inviting, and I could ask questions, and I could find answers, and it wasn't just regurgitating facts all the time. So um, that brings me a little bit more into how I will structure this class. So there's been a lot of research on how people learn things, anything. Um, one of the reasons why I love working with young kids is because they're still curious and they still ask so many questions. Um, they're still open to learning because they're still learning everything about the world around them. They're like the perfect little scientists. So um, there have been a couple of scholars that have come up with various sort of hierarchies on how people learn things. Um, and I will structure this class based on uh, the most research the most recent research on, on exactly how people learn. Um, so Bloom's taxonomy is one and Webb's de depth of knowledge is another, which I'll show you in a second. But it's sort of a, uh, a hierarchy of how we get through to be able to really truly understand things. Like when you become an expert, you get yourself up to the top of this pyramid. And when you're just starting out, you're down at the bottom of this period. So the very lowest level of knowledge is essentially recall of information, facts, being able to list things, locate things, name things, sort of what my high school biology class was. Um, remember all of these body parts. Can you identify where they are? Remember all of these different plants, that sort of thing. So that's sort of the lowest level of knowledge you can have. So you may know the names of some things, but if you don't know um, what they are or how they work or how it connects to some other organ, then you don't know very much. So I do not know much biology. I would guess many of you probably know far more than I do since my last biology class was decades ago. So the next level is starting to uh, be able to understand things, discuss things, summarize things. Um, and you can go, that's sort of the comprehension level. Application means you now know enough that you can, you can apply that knowledge, um, maybe even into a new situation. Um, you can use problem-solving method, methods. You can start experimenting yourself. That's the application level. Analysis, again, is taking it further. Um, synthesis, even more so. And by the time you get to evaluation, uh, you're much more in sort of the expert range where you can start to compare ideas, evaluate outcomes, uh, judge things, recommend things, rate things. Um, so whatever job or career you go into, um, that's what they're going to be hiring you for, for your ability to reach that evaluation level so that you can become a, uh, a productive member in that particular career. So in this class, I don't expect everyone to get the evaluation. Um, we're going to be focusing more in the application and analysis sort of range. Um, there will not be a whole lot of stuff at the knowledge level. So it, this is not going to be um, identifying what constellation this is. There may be some things um, where you have to be able to remember what something's called so that you can then talk about it. For example, um, recognizing what, what uh, moon phase, if I show you a picture, what moon phase is this? And once you know what moon phase that is, you may be able to use that information to be able to figure out 
more, you may be able to apply, I know that moon phase, I know where it is, so therefore I know what time this picture must have been taken, things like that. And I know that may not make no sense right now, but that's something that we're going to work ourselves towards in the future. So web step of knowledge is a, is a similar sort of hierarchy, um, but it contains four different levels. Level one, that lowest level is what is the knowledge. Two is how can we use the knowledge? Three is why can we use that knowledge? Why is that knowledge useful and important, whereas maybe some other knowledge isn't? Um, and then four is what else can we do with this knowledge? Um, and so I like this sort of infographic on those four levels, which rename them a little bit um, from what I just did. But again, that lowest level is all about recall. Um, whereas levels two and three start getting into concepts and strategic thinking, whereas four gets into more open-ended tasks that require um, much more complex thought. So um, we will primarily be living in sort of the, the levels two and three, um, and there may be some things where we extend to four, but it won't be as many. So I just wanted to give you a rough idea of sort of what this class is like and how I will be um, approaching this class. Um, and I will provide a little bit more information in another video on Monday once I have the rest of Canvas set up for you all. Um, but I wanted to create this intro video for you all to watch and um, for me to talk to you about a, little, a few things asynchronously. Um, prior to you taking um, a survey. So on the first day of class for any of my classes, whether it's astronomy or anything else, um, I always give a sort of get to know you survey. And um, this time, because of the situation we're living in, I've added some technology access questions so that I can get an idea of the technology that you have access to um, and any limitations that you're running into, any problems. Um, so that I can structure the class to be as effective as possible. Um, so whether that is you don't have access to a laptop and I can get you access to the laptop, um, or if I need to burn some DVDs of videos for you to watch so that you don't have to worry about using up all of your internet, I can do that. I'm willing to do that. Um, I'm absolutely willing to work with you as much as possible to make this successful especially given everything that's going on right now. So uh, the get to know you info, the math science background questions, those are ones I always ask every time. The technology access stuff will be new. And then I'm also gonna ask you for um, a contact phone number for emergencies. So in talking to colleagues and, uh, and other students in classes, it's becoming clear that, that there's a small percentage of students that are sort of going um, off the radar and given everything that's going on i know many of us are unsure whether that's because um, something has happened in their personal life or if work is becoming too much or what so um, if i see that uh, a particular student is not responding is not submitting um, assignments on time i'll send an email check in i'm absolutely open to um, accommodations if things are pro proving a little too difficult for you. And this is an eight week class, so things move much faster. Um, so that's a little bit added strain on things. But if my emails go unanswered for a week or so, then I'm gonna try and call just, just to make sure you're okay. And all you have to do is say, yes, I'm good. I'll get back to you when I can. And that's all I need. I just wanna make sure that everyone's, um, and again, I know okay is not the best way, but, uh, but I just need some reassurance that everything's good, um, or as good as they can be. And that, uh, and that if we need to work out some sort of accommodation that we can when you're ready. Um, but the silence right now from everyone is, uh, is pretty scary. So um, if you're willing to do that, I would really very much appreciate it. Um, as far as class goes, one of the, uh, Technology pieces that I've been utilizing in recent classes is Slack. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the number one platform that's used in businesses. So depending on what career you're going into, um, your, your business um, may be using this already. So it's a communication tool similar to texting or group me's or any of that sort of stuff that I know a lot of students use to keep in, track with, keep in touch with each other. Um, it's uh, an app that you can download on your phone or you can use it in the web browser. 
um, but it, it's essentially like text messaging. And the reason why I like it is that for me personally, at least my emails, things get buried very, very quickly. And if there are questions from you all, I wanna to get to them as soon as possible so that you're not waiting on me to be able to move forward. Um, so since Slack works like a text message, I've got my phone set up so that it notifies me as soon as something comes in. Um, so then I can go and address it uh, much sooner than I would be if it was just an email. Uh, the other thing that's nice that I like it better than like discussion boards and things like that is again, that notification so I can get to it sooner. But if we're all talking together in the same channel, I promise you 99% of the time, if you have a question, so does everyone else. So if we utilize Slack in the channel where everyone can see it, then everyone gets to see the answer too. So it'll cut down on the number of emails that I have to go through and spend. Um, and since everyone's time is getting crunched nowadays, that seems a very efficient use of our time. You can direct message me in Slack if there's something that you really don't want to, uh, don't want to say. But depending on what it is, I may copy and paste that question into the main Slack channel again, because usually if someone has a question, so does everyone else. Um, so we'll use that as our main communication tool um, as opposed to email if we can. Um, again, you feel free to email me. My email will be in Canvas so you can go through and see it. But, um, but Slack will definitely be a lot faster to get through. So there will be a link to click to join um, on Canvas. Um, and then we can set it up. There won't be any grades associated with using Slack at all. It's simply communication. Um, you can share files and things like that in Slack as well, uh, if you want to. So uh, basically anything that you can do as far as texting goes, you can utilize on Slack also. So um, I think that's it. So after this, please go through and complete that survey as soon as possible. So I will be waiting to see the responses from that survey to, to um, design and select certain parts of the class. So I am waiting on those responses to finalize some of the assignments and topics and things like that that we're gonna do. So I appreciate you filling that as soon as possible. Thank you so much. And I will see slash talk to you again on Monday. All right.